Well, the Lord be with you on this beautiful summer day as the Lord calls and invites us into his house on this day. And I want to welcome everyone who is uh, joining us by live stream, who've tuned in. Glad that you could be uh, part of our worship this day as the Lord calls and gathers us in his name, the name of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so before we enter into worship, I want to invite you to stand and just turn around as people are still coming in. And as people feel comfortable, greet them with the peace and joy of the Lord. So let us come together. And uh, as we have restored, renewed the connection card, I just want to encourage you, if you have a prayer request, you can let us know. Um, if there's any way you want to serve, you can check that on there. If you're new, uh, we want to welcome you. We'd, we'd love to connect with you. And you can drop those connection cards in the offering box at the Information Center. That's also where you can place your offerings if you're not giving online or electronically. But um, let's stand as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. And I want to begin with a few verses from Psalm 57. It says, Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. I call to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He reaches down from heaven and saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. God sends his faithful love and truth. He invites us to find our refuge in him. And I want us to do that right now. If you would bow your heads with me, and as we bring our, all of our concerns, all the baggage of this past week, as we bring our sins, our fears, our anxieties, as we confess those to the Lord, let us take a few moments to just examine our hearts and lives and confess our sin to the Lord and give him all of our burdens, our anxieties, our fears, our doubts. Let's take a few moments and do that. Good and gracious God, you invite us, sinners, broken people, people consumed with worry or fear or doubt, you, you call us to come just as we are, to come and to, to freely acknowledge our sinfulness and how we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. Lord, how we have not loved you as you've called us to. And Lord, to acknowledge the fears, the anxieties, the doubts that are in our lives Lord, we give those to you, and we ask for your mercy. We ask for your redeeming love to cleanse, to renew us, to awaken us to your grace. Hear us for the sake of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. And I declare to you the redeeming love of your heavenly Father, that the blood of Jesus was shed for you. And he laid down his life so that in his name, as you have turned to him and confessed your sins, I declare that your sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. You are cleansed, you are redeemed, and you are given a new, clean heart. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that love is what awakens us this morning. Just as the psalmist says, wake up my soul, wake up harp and lyre, I will wake up the dawn, I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples, I will sing praises to you among the nations, amen? If you would say after me, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. and so let his love awaken us to praise him for his redeeming love and grace this day.
you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out from the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. shaking all the dead are coming back to life I'm back to life hear the song awaken all creation sing we're alive cause you're alive you called me out from the grave you called me into the light you called my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater
Jesus Messiah to you You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and your name is exalted over all. For you, have, you came as the only begotten Son of the Father, that by your redeeming love, we would be set free. That you gave your life in suffering and in death for us to pay for our sins, and that by your death, death was destroyed, and with your rising from the dead, that we might have life, and to know by the Spirit that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that we come to the Father only through you. And so we pray that you would awaken us by your Spirit with the light of truth that you bring, that we would always walk in that light, that you would strengthen us to stand firm against the powers of darkness. And Lord, that you would lead us to the way of everlasting life. To you belongs all glory, honor, and praise. For your goodness, for your grace, for you rule and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first Old Testament scripture reading on this day is from Joshua chapter 24. Joshua had brought the people into the promised land. The Lord had scattered the peoples. And Joshua gives one last address, appealing to them to not give in to the idols of the nations, but to serve and worship only God. It's Joshua 24, 1 to 2, 14 to 18. Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem and summoned Israel's elders, leaders, judges, and officers, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, and picking up at verse 14, Therefore fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, And worship the Lord. But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourselves today which you will worship. The gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. The people replied, we will certainly not abandon the Lord to worship other gods. For the Lord our God brought us and our ancestors out of the land of Egypt and out of the place of slavery and performed these great signs before our eyes. He also protected us all along the way we went and among all the peoples whose lands we traveled through. The Lord drove out before us all the peoples, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too 
will worship the Lord because he is our God, says the word of the Lord. And from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we've been hanging out in Ephesians, and this will serve as the basis for our message this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 21. Paul writes and says, But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be named, not even be heard among you, as is proper for saints. Obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. For know and recognize this, every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater, does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people but as wise making the most of the time because the days are evil so don't be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is and don't get drunk with wine which leads to reckless living but be filled by the spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making music with your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. And finally, from John 6, as we've been hearing from Jesus' bread of life discourse, as we walk the path, he feeds us with himself. John 6, 51 to 69. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. At that, the Jews argued among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your ancestors ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, This teaching is hard. Who can accept it? And Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, asked them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and are life, but there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One 
of God. Let us pray. Father, I ask that your words, that are spirit and life, would be at work in us, that your spirit would have free course in this place. In your holy and precious name we pray. Everyone said, amen. A praise and worship gathering was scheduled last week on Sunday in Portland by Canadian pastor Arthur Pulowski. And there were thousands of Christians that gathered together in a park in Portland just to pray, to praise God. I mean, to pray for their city, to pray for the nation, to pray for the church. And while they were praying and praising God, as someone put it, it was like an angry mob rolled up. Antifa showed up in a very violent way. And as one person described it, they started to throw flash bombs into the crowd. Even amongst families and with infants and children, just throwing flash bombs and then started hurling chunks of concrete into the crowd, macing people, throwing rotten eggs, and then throwing those... Uh, Caltrops, you know, those little spiky things into the street to blow out tires as the crowd was then dispersed. Now, it's interesting because the media just gaslit this. You know, and most of the media was like, oh, there wasn't Christians gathering. Oh, Antifa's not violent. Oh, this didn't happen. Fake, phony, false. As, as many reported on the event and, and Faithful journalists like, yes, it really did happen. But this was completely gaslit by much of the media. Oh, there wasn't violence among Christians. Yes, there was. Unfortunately, pointing out the fact that too many of these news outlets are not reporting the news, but spinning a narrative based on an ideology. And, and, you know, and, and this is just a small picture of the spiritual battle that is raging, not only in our nation, but around the world. A spiritual battle where the powers of darkness, Satan, all of his demonic forces of evil, you know, just like in this picture that I've shown before, like these raging waves want, want, to, want to overwhelm and destroy God's good creation, and especially his church, especially his people. You see, and over against the heavenly armies of light, a reminder that there's a spiritual battle in the heavenlies between the light of God's glory and truth and the spiritual forces of darkness and evil. And you know, I have no doubt that there's people in Antifa who have well-intentioned motives in terms of there's an issue or an injustice that they want addressed. Lord knows there's plenty of injustices in our nation. And yet, they get swept up into a movement that, for many, is based on an ideology that, first of all, is godless. God is not part of the picture. God is not in the center. And that it's humanistic. It's all about man and what man has to do to put things right. And not only that, but it's, there's a moral relevancy. That there is no absolute moral truth. It's all about what the desires of our hearts are. And so Christianity then becomes a target. Because, you see, we come along and say, well, we believe this is God's word. We believe there's an ob objective truth. There's an objective moral standard. And we say that there, there is salvation, and it's in the person of Jesus. And so when we make these claims of truth, those who believe in a moral relevancy, that there is no absolute truth. This is deemed as a form of fascism. Antifa, anti-fascist. And so anything you know, that would be an outward, external order, institution, is deemed oppressive, fascist, and it has to be torn down. So that Christianity becomes one of the primary targets because it's deemed an objective, moral, truth standard that is oppressive, that is fascist, and has to be torn down. But this is just one little example of a larger spiritual battle that is 
intensifying, is raging, you know, in our nation and around the world, where, where the enemy wants to destroy all that is good, all that God has created to be good. So how are we to respond as followers of Jesus? Are we to just try to you know, close our mouths, be silent, try to hope to get by? Are we to go to, the, you know, head for the bunker? You know, I'll admit, there's times like, oh, Tracy, wouldn't it be great? Just go off the grid, live in the Upper Peninsula, get away from it all. It'd be nice. How are we to respond? Do we respond with violence? No. Paul calls us not to flee, not to hide, not to stay silent. Paul calls us to engage in the spiritual battle, right where the Lord has put us. Now, as Paul in his letter to the Ephesians gives us this 30 to 40,000 foot view of what's cosmically going on. And here is Ephesians is, is, you know, progressing in his letter. We're, we're just seeing the cosmic battle that is forming between the powers of darkness and the light of God's glory and presence. And so Paul encourages us to engage in this battle that is raging all around us. And the first thing he does is remind us of our identity. Who we are. He says... Writing to the Ephesians, he says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You know what's interesting about that? He doesn't say, you were in the darkness. He says, you were once darkness. That characterized your being, who you are. You know, that we're born into this world in spiritual darkness. That it, it is our very nature, bound by the powers of sin and the powers of evil, living in the fear of death. He says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, that you have been united to him, you who have come to believe in him and who have been baptized, not just that you're in the light. He says, you are light. Jesus is your light. It's like someone who has come into a dark room, has flicked on the light switch, and the darkness is scattered. And now it's full of light, reminding us of who we are because Jesus, the light of the world, has come into our flesh and blood, into the darkness, giving his life in suffering and death for darkened sinners who are dead, blind, and enemies of God, so that by his death, shedding his blood for our sins and dying our death, Rising from the dead, the light was turned on and the darkness was scattered. So that when we're brought to faith, and for the Ephesians, many of them, that was as adults who lived pagan lives of darkness and then came to Christ. For us, it's whenever we have been brought to faith and baptized and that the light has been turned on in our lives. Whether it's as little kids who were brought by our parents to baptism and taught, and for some then kind of going off into the darkness and then being brought back again or being converted as a youth or an adult, it's a reminder, this is who you are now, united to Christ. He has shown the light of his truth. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You have been claimed by the Heavenly Father and in him you have hope. You have his love in your life. So Paul says, Remember, this is who you are. We're going to wrestle with the darkness. We still have the remaining sinful darkness in our flesh that we battle with. But in Christ, our core identity is not darkness. You're light in the Lord. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You're holy. And so even when we struggle with the darkness, with our sin, we're brought back to that identity in Jesus. You're light. So as we're reminded of who we are, Light in the midst of darkness. Paul exhorts us how we are to engage in the battle. And first of all, he says, don't be deceived by the darkness. Which, you know, that kind of suggests we're susceptible to being deceived. You know, the powers of darkness with their lies, their propaganda, their fake narratives want to pull us back into the darkness, want to snuff out the light of Christ. And so Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty arguments. Now, that's interesting. 
empty arguments. Arguments that may sound good. It's like, oh, well, you know, maybe God's word isn't completely relevant for us today. And, you know, you're supposed to be nice. You're supposed to be non-judgmental. And, you know, can you really live the way he calls you to live? And shouldn't you just let, you know, peace and don't step on toes? And who knows if you really have the truth? And Paul says, it might look shiny on the outside, but it's empty. It's hollow. There's nothing there. He says, don't be deceived. Why? He says, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedience because of these things. In other words, God's holy, just, righteous love that opposes in wrath, it opposes all that is evil, all that is dark, all that is not good, all that, that would destroy his good creation. He opposes that. Is coming on the disobedient because of these things. What things? Well, right before this, he had made very clear, especially the Christians in Ephesus were the temple of Artemis, just wild sexual immorality, with the temple of prostitutes, and it was just kind of, well, this is just part of your worship. This is just how you live. And there's no moral boundaries. In fact, this is part of how you worship. And he's like, don't be deceived by any of that. And, and then for us, Anyone who would water down God's word or the truth is like, well, you know, maybe it doesn't completely apply to us. Paul makes very clear as he points out these specific items, sexual immorality, impurity, greed. He says, don't let it even be heard among you. Obscene, foolish talk, crude joking. He says, for no one recognized this in verse 5. Every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater. Now, the key here is not that it's anyone who has committed any of these sins or struggles with them. No, it's someone who commits them without any remorse, any sorrow, because it's their idolatry. It's what they're focused on. There's no unrepentance. There's no repentance, no sorrow, no faith. They just continue headlong into it. For someone who lives like that, he said he does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Those are strong words. Those are strong words. It's a warning. It's like for someone who would give themselves wholeheartedly to these immoral ways that transgress what God has given and created. He says, you are excluding yourselves from the light of his life. And here's where the darkness would snuff out the light. And so Paul says, don't become their partners. Don't accept these empty arguments. Which, And you see the propaganda in our culture. It's like, oh, well, those are outmoded traditional ways. And you even see some churches, this progressive Christianity, it says, oh, watering down. Well, you don't need to live that way. Or, you know, they, these are new days. And we're, we need to say No. And to put it in a positive way, I mean, we're not to judge anyone. We're to love everyone and yet firm, hold firmly to the truth that God created to just take one issue, the matter of sexuality. God created marriage and the good gift of sex to be within marriage between a biological man and a biological woman. That's God's design. And so Paul's making very clear, don't be deceived by nice sounding but empty arguments. Don't become their partners. Now, it's kind of like when Joshua told God's people in the promised land. He's like, okay, he's given you the land. Whatever you do, don't give in to their suggestions to worship their gods. That would draw your hearts away from him. Well, if you want to do that, he goes, well, then choose this day which other false god you want to serve. Don't be deceived. Then Joshua said, but for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to we're going to live in the blessings that he has given to us. And so Paul saying, don't be deceived by the darkness that distorts and twists and tears down what God has created, the order that he's given in his creation. Don't be deceived, but live in the light of the Lord's will. Here's how we engage in the battle. That we're light in the Lord. We're no longer darkness. Now Paul says, live in that. 
live in the light of what his will is. His will to save us and his will that we live out of that salvation. So notice he says, walk as children of light. You know, the image of walking, that you're on a path, that you're on a journey. And it's where you go, in your vocations, in your relationships, that your whole walk in your life is one as a child of God filled with the light of Christ. And that we're to be his image bearers. That he who has lit up our lives with his redeeming love, his grace, that's to shine forth from us. And so he calls it the fruit of the light. Expressing that light as fruit. Kind of like this fruit of the spirit. You know, fruit is sweet to the taste. And fruit nourishes someone and feeds them. So he says our lives that that reflect the light of Christ's redeeming love. To, are to be expressed and reflected in our lives everywhere we walk, everywhere we go, so that people can taste the sweetness of his redeeming love. And he says they're characterized by these three things. Goodness. As God has been good to us and blessed us, is that we want the good of everyone. We want to benefit others. We want to ble- build them up, not tear them down. And so as God has blessed us, we want to bless others. We want what is good, what is best, and that we express the righteousness of God. As we are put right with him, we want others to be put right with him. We want a broken world to be put right. We want injustices to be addressed and put right. And finally, that we express the truth of God. In a culture of lies and deception, that we would stand in the truth. Jesus is the truth. And also everything that conforms with that truth of who God, our creator, is, is revealed in Jesus. Which means not giving in to any lies, any propaganda, any false narratives, but saying, no, we're a people of truth. Wherever. That applies. And he notices he's testing what is pleasing to the Lord. That in the fire of experience, it is figuring out, okay, what in this circumstance would please God? How can I reflect the light here on my job amidst workers who are being hostile and angry? What would please God? And that means knowing what pleases God. Knowing his revealed will. What aligns with his revealed will. What's pleasing to him? Which means in a day and age when more and more Christians are biblically illiterate, it means we have to know it's pleasing to the Lord. We have to know his will. We have to receive the light of his truth in Holy Scripture, in his word. So that we can test in the fire of everyday experience. Lord, how am I to express the light of your love? How am I to walk that out in these circumstances? So not giving in to the lies of the darkness. Walking in the light of his will. And Paul says exposing the works of darkness. Yeah. Can you believe he actually says that? We are, he wants, God wants to use us to expose the works of darkness. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness. So he re- reemphasizes that. He says instead expose them. Wait a minute. You mean I'm supposed to be like a prophet? Well, not necessarily. You don't necessarily have to be a Jeremiah. But it's as we refuse the lies of the darkness, as we walk in the light of Christ, that light that shines from us, it will expose what's in the darkness. He will use us. He says, for it's shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. You know, if you think of, and I've used this illustration before, someone stops the night for this cheap motel, goes in his room, is there something on the floor? Flicks on the light, and all the cockroaches go for the dark corners. It's like, oh boy. Well, the light just revealed those cockroaches, and they're fleeing for the darkness. And you see, that's exactly when we're filled with the light of Christ, wherever we go, As we're walking in that light of Christ, it will expose the darkness. But they will want to scurry. They will want to flee. They will want to hide. Because, you see, evil doesn't want to be visible. So he says it's shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. 
Yeah, if we truly knew the demonic evil that was at work in our nation, that was at work maybe in our government, it was at work in the music industry or Hollywood, we would probably be horrified because that's the nature of evil. It doesn't want you to know. What we see is not the true depth of its perversity because it wants to stay hidden. It wants to be, it wants to have a nice, shiny angel of light appearance. But wherever the Lord sends us, he uses us to shine the spotlight. He says everything exposed by the light is made visible. It's like flashlight, you know, going into all dark corners and you see, oh, look how dirty it is behind the couch. For what makes everything visible is light. And what the Lord wants to do is wake people up. Get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And that has happened for us in Christ. Those of us who believe, he has raised us from spiritual death. And he wants others who are in the sleep of the darkness of their sin to be raised to faith, to be raised to new life, to have the light of Christ shine on them. And so he uses us just by walking in his light. It will expose the darkness around us. I've had little bits, pieces of this through the years. And I can think way back to even before going to seminary, having a number of jobs. and Sometimes in simple ways, you see it. And I remember a couple jobs in college where all of a sudden someone's like cussing up the storm like a drunken sailor. And all of a sudden, oh, I'm sorry. You know, around, all of a sudden around me, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I shouldn't cuss like that. And, I can remember a couple times, and I thought, what made you think that I'm offended by that? Because I gave no visible, I didn't say anything, they didn't know I was a Christian, I hadn't verbally said it yet. And yet, there were instances like that, where it's like, all of a sudden, they became apologetic, or, or sorry, it's like, oh, I, this, is, this is wrong. Have you ever had that happen? Where someone just knows, this is wrong when they're around you, because the light of Christ is exposing that. And, and, and there's times that people will even, all of a sudden, they'll see it and they'll want to, I have this happen even to this day. You know, I told you sometimes I have hairdressers who are all of a sudden, oh, they're sharing their life and some of their deepest, darkest secrets. So I have no idea why I'm sharing this with you. Well, I don't know either. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's like it, somehow they're just like, I just got to get this out. But, you know, another response, people get hostile. People get angry. Oh, I've had this happen before. Someone gets angry. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. What did I say? What did I do? Because it's like, I don't want to see what you're exposing in my life. Get away. And so here's where the response of the world, a hostility to the light of Christ shining in our lives, shining through his church that wherever we go, even walking, just walking in the light of Christ every day, and there will be people, it will expose the evil in them, and they'll resist, they'll get hostile, they'll want to fight back, they want to shut you down, they want to cancel you. That's what's going on. They don't want the evil exposed. But this means, as we seek to not be deceived by the darkness, to walk in the light of Christ, realizing he's going to expose the evil. Sometimes when we have opportunity to even speak the truth, say, you know what? This is why I believe the truth is. We have to make the most of the time and wisdom that he's given us. Pay careful attention, Paul says, than to how you walk, how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of the time because the days are evil. Now, yes, God wants us to have a Sabbath rest. There's a time and place for vacation, recreation, time with your family. That's good. But then our whole life has Christ at the center. When we get consumed by any one thing that displaces Christ, it could be our job, it could be a hobby, it could be recreation, it could be whatever it is, we're a fool. At that point, you're a fool. Because we've been brought into the light to live in the light with him at the center. And if he gets displaced by anything else and we dither our time in the darkness or we just mess around with all kinds of trivialities in life, Paul says, you're a fool. I'm a fool. He says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's 
God's will is to make us his children, to embrace us with his love. He's forgiven us. He's shown the light of his truth in us, given us the hope of everlasting life so that other people may be woken up to the truth to redeem and save and draw people to himself and to use us, even exposing the darkness, the evils, the injustices of this world. So Paul says, understand what the Lord's will is. Making the most of our time every day, From the moment we get up in the morning, Lord, what's your will for my life? How would you guide and direct me? He says, and don't get drunk with wine. You know, all the ways we want to anesthetize the pain and get plastered with beer or wine or drugs or or food or whatever. He says, don't do that. That leads to reckless living. But be filled by the Spirit. Let the Spirit in Christ given to you fill you with the light of his wisdom. To know his love, his grace, so that we can walk as children of light in a dark world, engaging in the battle. I don't know how fierce it's going to get. I don't know what's coming. Just know this, the battle's raging. It has been. It will continue to rage. And we're called to be children of light and to walk in that light. You know, there's a conclusion to the prayer and praise meeting in Portland. Do you know that they decided to go back the next day? So the worship leader named Sean, he said, members of Antifa showed up in Portland last night to threaten, harass, bully, and intimidate us. Mom and her baby were tear gassed. Antifa stood 10 feet from me as we lifted up our voices in praise. But when they met again, Antifa came. They decided to go to the exact same spot. Yeah, following, one reporter said, following a coordinated violent attack, Christian families in Portland, thousands gathered to worship at the same spot the next day. They did have some volunteer security. And Antifa came back. They started to attack them. Now, Antifa was the ones that ended up dispersing at the end and in the midst of it and the worship leader he said uh, we kept worshiping God in spite of their beginning to attack us again and God moved powerfully worship ended up ringing true for at least one self-professed Antifa member I love this he came to do them violence and the power of the worship and the words that they sang it exposed the darkness in him and it woke him up. He ended up coming to faith in Christ. <laughs> he came to do violence against them and his heart was melted and he became a follower of Jesus. As he said he ended up giving his life to Christ in faith. One member of Antifa, or as he put it in his, his uh, tweet, who came to disrupt our service, was saved, giving his life to Jesus. It's time for a bold and believing church. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and grace. The church is on the move, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is why we can't back down. People are scared, addicted, lonely, suicidal, and hopeless, and we have the hope of the world inside of us. It's time we boldly bring Jesus to the world. You were once darkness. Now you are light in the Lord. So let us walk as children of the light. Amen? Please stand. As we prepare to come to the table of the Lord, who feeds us his very body and blood in this sacrament with the bread and the wine, Let us bring all of our concerns, our petitions, our thanksgivings to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Oh, merciful God, you are the almighty God, the creator of the universe, the giver of every good and perfect gift, the one who has made us, who has designed us for the sake of knowing your joy, for the sake of knowing life in your presence. And we thank you that though we were once darkness, that you reached down through Christ, through his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the giving of the spirit, through the gospel, that you have brought us into the light. 
by bringing us to faith and by being baptized into your name, that you, by your spirit, light up our lives. And we pray that you would renew your presence, your light in us this day. Strengthen us, Lord, and give us the courage, the strength to resist the lies and the deception of the darkness. Lord, that we would walk in the light of the truth that we have in your word. To know you, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. That the fruit of that light would be expressed in our lives. Everywhere you put us, in all of our callings, in all of our vocations. And that you would use us to expose the darkness. That people may be awakened and brought to you. To know the redeeming love and grace that you pour out. Because you've conquered evil and you will finally, in your judgment and wrath, you will finally destroy and oppose all that is against your good creation, against your love. And so you seek to redeem us, to save us. Do that work through us, your people, your church, all around the world. That you would make us to be a light, to be salt. That we would not back down, that we would not be silenced, that we would not... Be intimidated, that the enemy would not provoke fear, but that you would make us shining lights to boldly testify to you in our lives, in our actions, and even with our words, where you give us opportunity. And so, Father, we pray for your church, and we pray that we would be salt and light in our nation. You have blessed us with so many blessings in this nation. We pray for our president, our government, our leaders. Lord, we pray for you to turn our nation, turn our government in a way that is pleasing to you. Turn the hearts of people back to you, to the path of goodness and righteousness and truth. And Father, we pray this day as we rejoice in all the blessings you pour out in our lives, the blessings of this beautiful weather here in West Michigan, and Lord, the the blessings of home and family and friends Lord, we bring our cares, our needs to you. And Lord, we lift up, first of all, those who need your healing touch. We pray for Sherry Miller's mother, Ruth Cooper, as she recovers from foot surgery and other health ailments, that you would touch her, strengthen her, be present with her. And Lord, that you comfort those who grieve. And Lord, we grieve, but we also rejoice that Eloise Boyd has been brought into your heavenly presence. But, Lord, we we grieve her loss. And so we pray that you comfort the Boyd family and all family and friends of Eloise and all of us here who grieve her loss, and yet we rejoice that she's in your heavenly presence. Lord, we also grieve with Paul Goosen at the death of his father. Uh, Lord, that you would comfort the family with the hope of everlasting life, comfort them with your presence and peace. And so, Lord, we just bring before you all of our needs, our cares, our petitions, knowing that, uh, Lord, you hear us and you have given us the hope of a renewed creation, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And we know that we worship with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven surrounding your throne that are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. And as we worship in your heavenly presence. Let us always be bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is my blood of the New Testament, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. 
this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. And let all who confess their sins in Jesus, who trust in him as Lord and Savior, who trust in his words he gives his body and blood for you in this sacrament, you are welcome to come to his table. And also as a note, as we are going back to our pre-COVID communion distribution, and we kind of forgot last time, when you are ushered out, there will be two lines on each side. So come up in two lines, and then whoever's serving the host will serve that host to one line, the second line, and then you have the two communion distribution lines fanning one way, fanning the other. I know we can remember it. We can, we can, we can do it. So as you prepare, prepare in prayer, meditating on God's gift to you in the sacrament. Christ is formed in me. Hallelujah. I'll live my life in remembrance. Hallelujah. You promise I will. Your grace remind me of the price you paid. Hallelujah. I'll live in remembrance.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his smiling face on you and give you his peace and flood your being with the light of his hope, his joy, and his peace that you would walk in that light to life everlasting, safe in the embrace of his love. And all God's people said, Amen. As a Jesus-looking people, radiate that to one another. If you're new, I'm going to invite you to drop your connection card in uh, the box or stop at the information center. We have a gift for you, and you can drop your offering there. Otherwise, have a blessed, enjoyable day. God's peace.